The situation in Venezuela continues to deteriorate, and the political conflict there has caused more than 3 million people to flee. The man recognized by the United States and 50 other countries as Venezuela's interim president, Juan Guaido, failed to bring about a military uprising earlier this week to oust embattled President Nicolas Maduro. This as Venezuelans deal with food shortages, blackouts, and a lack of medicine and clean water. Carolee McGrath sat down with Andy Ryder, an associate professor of politics and international relations at Mount Holyoke College, to learn more. So his hope was he'd convince enough people in the military to defect to his side. Uh, it was a gamble. Uh, he did some kind of presentations on media with some military people next to him to try to portray that he had them behind him in hopes to get the military to swing to his side. It didn't work. He didn't have enough military people with him at the beginning and, uh, you know, sort of gambled. He would hope the rest of the military would defect. Uh, they did not. And uh, so he was sort of left with just more protest and no real change. And in an interview afterwards, he said, we just didn't have enough military guys, right? So um, that's his big thing to convince the military to come to his side. And so far, he's not been able to do that. And if he was able to do that, is that what would turn the tide in Venezuela? Definitely. The military controls the fate. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to do, though. So one thing that Maduro did is he placed the military in charge of almost all the ministries and the state-owned oil company. They control the food supply and the food distribution network, and they're making a ton of money off so of this. So they have no reason to yes. defect. No okay. reason to defect. And it, yeah. And in the meantime, you have all of these people who are suffering. Three and a half million uh, Venezuelans have left. Yes. Um, which is a tragedy. Yes, uh, it, it's terrible. I mean, you're talking about 10% of the population has left the country. Um, also, you, what comes along with hyperinflation, all these economic problems, you have no medicine in the hospitals, food shortages everywhere, and then crime is on the rise. Uh, last year, Venezuela had the highest murder rate in the world. Right? So it's becoming pretty desperate for that. The UN has said it's sort of a you know, cat humanitarian catastrophe. And because of the politics, not a lot of aid is getting into the country to help. Okay, so now Guaido is, has been recognized by the U.S. and many, many other countries over as... Over 50. Over 50, as, as the leader of the country. Of course, mm -hmm. Maduro um, is recognized by Russia and China, which is not yes. a surprise. Yes, not, definitely not a surprise. And you're seeing this kind of great power conflict play out to some extent in Venezuela. Uh, Maduro refused to take U.S. aid, um, U.S. humanitarian aid, which is sitting in Brazil and Colombia waiting to go over the border, but he won't let it over. But then China and Russia have sent aid, which he's accepted. And you're also getting military support from Russia. Uh, Russia sent a couple hundred military advisors uh, to, to help Maduro keep the military on his side and crack down on the protest. And you're having a, a really big tension between the two um, right now. It's, it's, it's kind of Putin poking Trump a little bit by creating disturbance in his own backyard. And so the U.S. Um, has imposed sanctions, but they have also said, some top leaders have said, you know, all options are on the table, which makes people, you know, wonder about military options. What do you think would happen with that? I don't think there'll be a military invasion. It would take well over 100,000 troops. Venezuela is twice as big as Iraq, um, and the terrain is terrible. The, the military is fairly large. And it, it would be difficult to launch an invasion where U.S. people would die, U.S. service, service people would die. Uh, I don't think that that would work. But the threat of the invasion is there to try to make the military in Venezuela think it might happen and then defect to Guaido. Um, and that's the whole idea. And to make the Russians and Chinese think that the U.S. might do something. I don't think the U.S. would invade. That being said, uh, part of the reason is that it's not a direct security threat to the United States right now. It'd be hard to convince the U.S. population to support something mm -hmm. like that. But just uh, yesterday, um, Vice President Mike Pence has come out and said that uh, Venezuela is now harboring Hezbollah, right, the terrorist group supported by Iran. And so then it starts to be coming a security threat to the United States. He said it's a failed state, and we know what happens in failed states. Terrorists go there. And so we might start seeing the, the administration talk about more justification for intervention if it's a direct threat to the United States security. But when you go back and look at uh, Venezuela's history, it was at one time the richest uh, country in Latin America. Yes. And now you have rolling blackouts and you have, you know, food shortages, you have, you know, just complete chaos. And you look at Chavez and, and now his, um, now Maduro, mm -hmm. and you look at a socialist regime, really, with, with a dictator in charge, uh, people will say, that is just a recipe for disaster. Yes. One of the problems is uh, Hugo Chavez promised all these social services to his supporters, and he provided them, but he couldn't pay for them. 
So he took out a lot of debt in order to pay uh, for all these goods that he gave to his people in order for them to support him and, and get elected. But that was something that was not sustainable. Um, government went into huge debt to do this. And then at the same time, we saw oil prices drop considerably. And so that ruined most of Venezuela's economy, which was built around oil. And so you end up then with a government who is doing what it could to buy the people particularly right before elections, he would give out lots of benefits, uh, but, but it wasn't uh, something he could actually afford. And then uh, gradually that starts to then um, uh, come to light and we start seeing the economic crisis that we have now. Now, I know you're a professor. Does this come up in conversation, especially, I know that, you know, many millennials sort of favor socialism and will say, you know, well, you know, Medicare for all or free college tuition. Does Venezuela ever come up in conversation in the context of your classroom? Oh, to some extent. And, and there are some Venezuelan uh, students at, at Mount Holyoke. And, uh, but it mainly comes up as a way to um, not give those benefits uh, out. Uh, you have an authoritarian leader who, who does it on, on his own will. There's tons of corruption. So it's not like a legislature. It's not like a, a voting for some sort of policy. It was really unilateral stuff to buy votes. And um, I think most would agree that that's not the way to provide sort of you know, big things like education and health care. Okay. And what do you think this does to the region? I mean, obviously, all of the countries in South America, you know, are, are going to be nervous about this going on. Yes. I mean, it, it has potential to be pretty destabilizing. Uh, we mentioned earlier the number of um, migrants leaving Venezuela. Over a million are in Colombia. And uh, we've seen elsewhere in the world that that's um, very difficult. It's expensive. Uh, it's problematic to, to host those people, provide goods for those people. And uh, it, it could definitely be um, destabilizing for the region and other countries. And so what do you think the way out is? And I don't know yeah. that European countries are, are convening and uh, there are groups that would like to have free elections soon. Um, but could you really hold elections in a situation like this? I wish I had a crystal ball that told us the way out. Um, I think going back to your earlier point about the military, that's the key. If the military uh, defects and decides to arrest Maduro and maybe send him off to Cuba, then you could see elections um, fairly quickly. Venezuela actually was a democracy through most of the Cold War and uh, was one of the countries in the region that was seen as kind of a beacon of hope and it wasn't a military dictatorship. So they do have a strong history of elections and voting. And so I think if, uh, if somehow there was a transition facilitated by the military, uh, there could be elections and it could turn into um, a stronger democracy. But how would they get to the military? Because Guaido was not able to do it this time. He yeah. has other people I know helping him, maybe trying to reroute that. But is, does he make a second attempt on that? I, I think there'll be lots of attempts. And I think there are, there are back channel attempts right now. I know uh, they're meeting with um, members of the military to try to get to convince them to defect. Uh, the United States is helping on this. So one of the key members of the military came out in support of Guaido. And then the US removed the sanctions on him as a reward for doing so. And so I think there's going to be all this stuff going on to convince enough of the military. And once we get to a tipping point, it'll happen very quickly. Um, but it's going to take a while, I think, to convince the military to, um, to move. And in, yeah. the, in the meantime, you have a lot of people suffering yes. there. You know, yes. who don't have food, don't have medicine as yeah. well. And that could be one of the things if it gets so bad that the population um, has more of an uprising than they do now. Um, and if it gets to be so big, then we could see the military realize that Maduro's going to be overthrown anyway and be the one who does it. Um, similar to happen actually when recently in Sudan, where we saw the military come in, remove the dictator um, to try to stop the civilian uprising from taking them out too.